Uriel found herself seething with anger towards the two other priests, who had dared to mock a saint who was chosen directly by God. She made it abundantly clear to them that unless they could provide a satisfactory explanation for their disrespectful behavior towards the saint, they would face grave consequences. Amidst this tense atmosphere, another woman, perhaps overwhelmed with remorse, beseeched Saint Uriel for forgiveness and earnestly attempted to apologize to her. However, to Uriel's dismay, she found herself rebuffing the apology, asserting that the woman was directing her contribution towards the wrong recipient. Even in her own mind, Uriel grappled with a sense of frustration at her inability to extend a proper apology to Ray for her earlier behavior, all due to the expectations placed upon her as a saint. Meanwhile, hidden from view behind a nearby tree, Ray observed this scene and couldn't help but empathize with Uriel. Ray could relate to the immense burden associated with bearing the title of a saint and the profound impact that her words could have on those around her. Ray could empathize deeply with the overwhelming burden of responsibility, having once been hailed as the genuine surgeon in a past life, carrying the weight of numerous expectations. Moved by this shared understanding, he made the decision to step forward from his hiding place behind the tree and address the others directly. With a calm and direct tone, he acknowledged that he now realized they all regarded him merely as a naive child and a symbolic figurehead of a saint. As the woman filled with guilt attempted to explain that this wasn't their intention, Ray gently insisted that their perception wasn't entirely inaccurate. However, before he could delve further into his introspection, Uriel interjected, admonishing him not to speak of himself in such a disparaging manner. Yet, Ray persisted, acknowledging that he possessed no divine powers and questioned what purpose he could possibly serve within the Holy Empire. He provocatively suggested that even if he had been chosen by God, perhaps he was simply suited to fulfill the role of a figurehead. Ray, keenly aware of the unspoken thoughts lingering among the group, understood that many likely have similar doubts about his capabilities, even if they were hesitant to voice them openly. Despite Uriel's protests, insisting that nobody would dare to think of him in such a manner, Ray interjected once more, affirming that there were indeed individuals within the Holy Empire who held such beliefs about him. Regardless, he acknowledged that even if that were not the case, his ability to alter such perceptions would be severely limited. Turning to Uriel, Ray inquired about his authority to address those who spoke ill of him behind his back. Upon receiving confirmation that he could indeed take action, Ray pressed further, seeking clarification on the potential consequences for those who dared to undermine his reputation. Uriel solemnly explained that such individuals would be subject to the judgment of the Inquisitors, a fate that could potentially result in their death. The gravity of this revelation struck the two priests, filling them with fear and prompting them to plead for Ray's forgiveness. With earnest promises to refrain from further blasphemy, they implored Ray for mercy, recognizing the severity of their transgressions and the dire consequences that awaited them if they persisted in their disrespectful behavior. He took a moment to think, then spoke to everyone there. He said he knew more people probably made fun of him. They called him a figurehead, a cocky kid, or said he had no power or respect. He agreed there was some truth to that, so, he decided to go to the Holy Empire for a few years to prove himself to everyone. One of the priests quietly asked what he meant. He said he'd make sure everyone who talked behind his back regretted it, and he'd make those who disrespected him remember this moment. Despite their disrespect, he chose not to punish the two priests there. They cried and apologized sincerely, and he forgave them, showing kindness. They promised to learn from their mistakes and repent. Ray expressed his hope that they'd regret their words even more in the future. To fulfill his goal of restoring honor to the Holy Empire, he vowed to do his best, even if it took years. Under the moonlight, his white hair and blue eyes shone, leaving everyone struck by his unusual beauty. They had never seen someone so beautiful before. He stood radiant, aligned with the moon behind him. After a while, Ray returned to his spot around the fireplace, where Uriel joined him. She teased him about his earlier speech. Ray offered her some leftover stew, saying it tasted best when warm, which Uriel happily accepted. As they watched a shooting star streak across the sky, Uriel marveled at their luck in seeing it together. Ray thought about his past life, where his name meant shooting star, but he had grown accustomed to his new name now. He mentioned the belief that if someone makes a wish while looking at a shooting star, it might come true. Upon hearing this, Uriel quickly closed her eyes and began to pray, which struck Ray as unusual for a saint who believed in myths. Uriel shared another story she had heard from the Empire, that if two people see a shooting star together, they'll happily die together. Ray dismissed the idea, stating that death could never be happy for anyone. 
as they gazed at the mesmerizing sight of the shooting star. Both pondered what a happy death would truly entail. The following day, they resumed their journey. A knight informed them they were nearing the Sills' territory and asked where they should head first upon arrival. The saints decided to meet with the duke immediately, as they were in a hurry. Their plan was to treat them as quickly as possible before heading to the Holy Empire due to time constraints. They were supposed to arrive at the Holy Empire soon for the baptism ceremony. The duke warmly welcomed them, expressing his genuine happiness and excitement that the saints had come to treat his daughter in person. He felt assured that it was their role as saints to bring relief to those in pain. Apologizing for rushing them, he urged them to quickly examine the princess. In a somber tone, he admitted that he would be devastated if anything happened to his daughter, and it pained him deeply to see her suffering. Iriel reassured him that they would attend to the princess promptly, and the duke thanked them earnestly for their kindness. Rat was impressed by Iriel's ability to inspire such trust in the duke even before she had done anything. A servant guided them to the princess's room where they found her. Both Ray and Ariel were shocked by the princess's condition. It was worse than Ray had anticipated. Half of the princess's body was covered in red spots, making him wonder if it was a severe case of dermatitis herpetiformis. He couldn't fathom why she hadn't received treatment sooner, before her condition had deteriorated to such an extent. Embarrassed by her appearance, the princess attempted to hide her body under the sheets, calling it hideous. Ariel approached her gently and asked her to place her hand on hers. The princess complied, and Ariel reassured her with a gentle smile promising that everything would be all right. A bright golden light emanated from Ariel's hand, illuminating the entire room. The Duke was astonished by the display of such powerful divine energy. Suddenly, the red spots on the princess's body began to fade away, disappearing within seconds. Tears of relief streamed down her face as Ariel informed her that the treatment was complete. Turning to the Duke, Ariel assured him that everything was now all right. Overjoyed, the Duke embraced his daughter, both of them crying tears of happiness. The Duke was overwhelmed with relief to see his daughter healthy again. With tears in his eyes, he expressed his gratitude to Ariel for her kindness. The princess had suffered for eight long years, and the duke had given up hope on her treatment. Now that she was well, he vowed never to forget their debt of gratitude. Ariel reassured him, saying they were simply fulfilling their duty as saints. Meanwhile, Ray was surprised that the healing had taken only a few minutes with divine powers, whereas he had expected a skin disease like that to require long-term treatment. He felt a slight disappointment that medicine didn't seem to play a role in this world. That night, the Duke hosted a feast in their honor, featuring various delicious dishes specially prepared for them. Ariel expressed her gratitude for the food, but Ray appeared lost in his thoughts. Prince Hopal, also present at the dinner table, praised Ariel for her extraordinary powers and thanked her for treating his sister. Ariel accepted his gratitude graciously and promised to convey his thanks to their lord, Gaia. Noticing Ray's distressed expression, the duke asked if the food wasn't to his liking, as he hadn't said a word while everyone else was talking. Ray quickly reassured the duke that the food was fine and apologized for causing any worry. Ariel chimed in, telling the duke not to fret, as Ray had a lot on his mind at the moment. She discreetly asked Ray what was wrong, but he brushed it off, saying he was just tired. Ariel advised him to get some rest, as they had arrangements to stay at the castle for the night. Ray's mind was filled with thoughts of his past life as a hard-working doctor. Despite being born with memories of his previous life, none of his medical knowledge seemed applicable in this world. He pondered whether he should let go of his past life as a miracle doctor and focus solely on being Ray in this world. Lying in bed, he wrestled with these thoughts. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door. Ray didn't respond, so Ariel spoke from outside. She reassured him that she wasn't sure what was bothering him, but encouraged him not to lose faith in himself. She reminded him that everyone faces hardships and doubts their abilities at times, but she hoped he wouldn't let it overshadow what he had accomplished so far. Ariel expressed her wish for him to return to his usual funny and goofy self, instead of feeling tired and restless. With a newfound determination, Ray quickly got up and pondered Ariel's words more seriously. He reassured himself that with his previous life knowledge, he would find something he excelled at in this world. Ariel, still outside his door, continued to encourage him not to give up. Suddenly, Ray opened the door with a genuine smile on his face and thanked Ariel, saying her words had really helped him. The next morning, something unexpected occurred. The princess hadn't been completely healed the previous day, and her illness had returned suddenly upon waking. The duke ordered his servants to quickly summon the saint. The duke questioned Ariel about why the princess's symptoms had returned despite her being healed by Ariel the day before. 
Ariel admitted she wasn't sure why the symptoms had returned after the treatment was completed. She offered to treat the princess once more, and the duke quickly agreed. However, Ray interrupted and requested to handle it this time. He approached the princess and asked her to give him her hand. The duke, uncertain whether a newly appointed saint could cure a disease that even experienced saints couldn't treat, suggested it would be better to let Ariel handle the task. Ray looked the duke straight in the eyes and explained that if his suspicions were correct, only he could heal the princess's condition at that moment. The duke, still uncertain of Ray's abilities, asked for clarification. Ray stated that treatments from the saints wouldn't work on the princess, they could cure her temporarily. But if the symptoms returned, they would be powerless. With determination, Ray asserted that the princess didn't need treatment from the saints but from him. Despite his lack of divine powers, Ray insisted that his treatment didn't require them. He would rely on the knowledge he already possessed to cure the disease. The princess supported Ray's stance, urging her father to trust him since they had exhausted all other options. Convinced by their words, the duke reluctantly agreed to entrust his daughter's care to Ray. With determination in his eyes, Ray promised to heal the princess. The following day, he began investigating the cause of her skin condition. Starting with basic hygiene, he examined everything meticulously. However, after discovering that the blankets, tablecloths, and clothes were washed daily, he ruled out poor hygiene as the cause. Additionally, since the castle was protected by a magic barrier, it was unlikely that an external parasite was to blame. Ray noticed a pattern in the princess's diet, particularly the common presence of bread. Bread was a staple in this world, often incorporated into various dishes. He also observed that her condition flared up after meals. Putting the clues together, he concluded that the princess was suffering from gluten sensitivity dermatitis, an allergy-induced skin condition triggered by gluten, an insoluble protein found in flour. Unfortunately, there were no effective medicines available in this world due to its underdeveloped state in medicine. Ray knew it would be challenging to create medicine using unfamiliar plants. However, he resolved to change the princess's diet as the only viable solution. The next morning, Ray visited the princess's room with her permission to check on her condition. He greeted her warmly and explained that her diet was likely the cause of her condition. He instructed her to avoid foods containing flour, like bread, and to refrain from scratching, even if it itched. The princess, confused and puzzled, questioned why she had to avoid her favorite food and whether Ray would use magic to heal her condition. Ray smiled reassuringly at the princess, explaining that his treatment involved preventing the spread of her condition by draining her blisters daily. He assured her that he would personally attend to this task to monitor her progress closely. Emphasizing the importance of rest, he advised her to take plenty of it for her recovery. Despite Ray's instructions, the princess couldn't comprehend how simply avoiding bread could improve her condition. Meanwhile, outside the room, Ariel inquired about the princess's condition, but Ray admitted that it had worsened. Ariel suggested using magic to heal her once again, but Ray explained that even with magic, the symptoms would likely return. Ariel questioned why they hadn't changed the princess's diet earlier if it would have helped her condition. Ray explained that they hadn't identified the dietary trigger until now, emphasizing the importance of uncovering the root cause before implementing treatment. Ariel expressed her belief in Ray's abilities, but acknowledged the king's lack of faith in him and their limited time in the castle. Despite this, she urged him to do his best. Ray understood the validity of her words but remained determined to try his hardest. Looking at him flustered, Ariel remarked that even if he looked at her with pleading eyes, the circumstances remained unchanged. Ray clenched his fist, realizing that it wasn't just about treating the princess anymore, it was about setting a precedent for how he would approach patient care in the future. With determination in his eyes, Ray asked Ariel to give him one week, promising to ensure the princess's complete healing within that time frame. During that period, Ray ensured that the princess drank a specific amount of water daily, 3 liters, totaling 21 liters per week. Regardless of circumstances, this was her required intake. The princess, behaving like a child, protested the necessity of consuming so much water, especially if it wasn't considered holy. Ray attempted to justify the regimen by explaining the benefits of water during allergic reactions, urging her to trust him. When foreign substances enter the body, the immune system generates histamine, 
Although histamine serves to safeguard the body against foreign invaders, for individuals grappling with allergies, its overproduction can wreak havoc, yielding adverse effects. Ensuring adequate water intake facilitates optimal cellular function, mitigating the impact of allergic reactions. Ray remained steadfast in his efforts to ensure the princess consumed ample water, resorting to forceful tactics when necessary. Perplexed and disheartened, the princess struggled to reconcile Ray's seemingly draconian methods with any semblance of saintliness, instead deeming him a handsome yet fanatical figure. As days elapsed, despite her initial resentment towards Ray's dietary restrictions and insistence on increased water consumption, the princess, bereft of alternative recourse, opted to place her trust in him. To her astonishment, her condition exhibited remarkable improvement at an accelerated pace, manifesting in visibly clearer skin with each passing day. Ray's gentle reminder of his commitment to her healing served as a poignant reassurance, evoking palpable elation within the princess. She gratefully acknowledged the efficacy of Ray's prescribed regimen, attributing her newfound wellness to his unwavering guidance. Ray reminded the princess not to neglect her treatment now that her skin had improved and emphasized the importance of consistency. The princess happily agreed, nodding in affirmation. Initially, Ray harbored concerns about how people in this world would respond to his treatment methods compared to those in his previous realm. However, it seemed that those worries were now unfounded. With the princess on the path to complete healing, Ray felt reassured. Yet, his optimism was abruptly challenged when the princess began clamoring for bread one day, citing withdrawal symptoms such as stress, anxiety, decreased focus, irritation, and nervousness. In this world, flour was deemed a staple, and experiencing withdrawal symptoms due to its absence was anticipated by Ray. However, allowing her to consume flour before completing her treatment would nullify all his efforts. He firmly instructed her to abstain from bread until her treatment concluded. To divert her attention from the cravings and alleviate her symptoms, Ray decided to introduce her to the game of chess. Using his energy as a blade, Ray meticulously crafted the chess pieces, each with precision and care. Observing him at work, Uriel inquired about his task, to which he explained that he was creating components for a game. Intrigued, Uriel questioned the sudden focus on gaming. Ray presented one of the chess pieces to Ariel, prompting her to share her thoughts on its appearance. Initially resembling a castle, potentially linked to the Holy Empire, Ariel then noted its resemblance to a crown. Excitedly, Ray packed the pieces into a bag and beckoned Ariel to follow him. They proceeded directly to the princess's chamber, where Ray also summoned the prince to join them. Perplexed by the saint's summons, as it was a first, the princess awaited an explanation. Ray acknowledged the novelty of his request and admitted to needing the prince's assistance. He introduced the nearly assembled chess set and explained its purpose in alleviating the princess's withdrawal symptoms. Ray outlined the rules of the game, where each participant commanded their own troops with the objective of capturing the opposing team's king. As a test of strategic prowess, the game aimed to determine the superior commander. However, Ray emphasized the importance of adhering to specific rules governing the movement of the chess pieces. Holding up the king chess piece, Ray explained its significance as a symbol of dignity and restraint, capable of only minimal movement, typically one space at a time. Contrasting this, he described the queen as a dynamic counterpart, unrestricted in movement as long as she refrained from capturing opponents. Each chess piece, Ray elucidated, operated according to its own distinct set of rules governing movement. Impressed, the princess expressed her intrigue, acknowledging the simplicity of the rules alongside the vast array of potential moves. Recognizing its value beyond mere entertainment, she noted the game's potential for enhancing military training, a sentiment echoed by Ray. Even the princess's father, she remarked, would likely appreciate the strategic depth of the game. With the rules thoroughly explained, Ray proposed a match between the princess and himself, eager to gauge her interest and hopeful that the game would aid in alleviating her withdrawal symptoms. Seated across from each other at the table, the game commenced after exchanging pleasantries and mutual assurances of competitive spirit. Observing the princess's evident enthusiasm for the game, Ray felt a sense of optimism, believing that it would indeed serve as a beneficial distraction for her. The princess and the saintess became even more engrossed in the game than Ray had anticipated. Playfully taunting the princess, the saintess teased her about having nowhere to hide in the game and suggested she surrender to become her subject. With the saintess emerging victorious in the first match, she rejoiced jubilantly, clapping with childlike glee, while the princess struggled to conceal her frustration at her defeat. 
Undeterred by her loss, the princess challenged the saintess to a rematch, prompting speculation from Rey that perhaps he was witnessing an attempt to mend their sibling relationship. Accepting the challenge with confidence, the saintess allowed the princess to make the first move, expressing certainty in her impending victory. Rey couldn't help but notice the enjoyment they all seemed to derive from the game. As the second match unfolded with heightened intensity, the prince intervened, offering the saintess the next move to showcase his true capabilities. Sensing the escalating tension, Rey intervened, urging them to calm down. Initially intended as a distraction from the princess's withdrawal symptoms, Rey found himself confronted with an unexpected turn of events. The prince eagerly shared the game with their father, highlighting its sophistication and its potential to assess the strategic acumen of military commanders. Rey realized that the game had unexpectedly captured the interest of the royal family, potentially altering his initial expectations for its role in the princess's treatment. The Duke was thoroughly impressed by Rey's creation, recognizing its potential to benefit their country if utilized effectively. As the Duke's interest in the game grew, unexpected developments ensued. The agreed-upon week had passed, yet there was no indication of their departure. During a stroll outside, Rey encountered servants engaged in playing the chess game he had designed. Elsewhere, he observed another group of servants crafting chess pieces. Taking in the scene, Rey realized that the game had captured the attention of everyone in the palace. What had initially been intended solely to alleviate the princess's withdrawal symptoms had unexpectedly gained widespread popularity. Rey found himself astonished by the unforeseen turn of events, never imagining that his creation would have such an impact on the castle and its inhabitants. Archduke Silios welcomed the saint and saintess in his throne hall. The saint had managed to fix his daughter's condition within just a week, and even created a new magnificent game called chess. The saint's performance was beyond his expectations. Thinking about his daughter's condition having gotten better, the duke could not stop smiling and expressed his heartfelt gratitude to the duo. As a father, it was painful for him to watch his own daughter suffer day in and out. As such he found no shame in bowing his head to his daughter's savior. Ariel felt that she did not deserve such high praise, after all it was Rey who had done everything on his own. The Duke told her not to be so humble, and also expressed his special gratitude to the Saint Rey. He then signaled a servant with his hand, who brought forward a chest with intricate gold patterns on it. As an apology for his rude behavior, as well as his thanks, he presented the gift to Rey. As the chest opened, Rey was amazed by the dazzle of the ring stored inside it. It was a ring that had been passed down to the rulers of the Cilios territory, and was given to them when they saved a dwarf. Rey was immediately taken aback, surprised at the worth of the item. He could not believe that the duke would give him a family treasure. On the outside, Rey expressed his hesitation to accept such a precious gift, but on the inside, he felt giddy from receiving such a rare item. The duke encouraged him to not hesitate and try wearing it, but Rey did not need to be told. He was already in the process of wearing the ring. When Rey wore the ring, he found that it was a little too big for him. He sighed with a little disappointment, thinking that he would not be able to wear it all the time if it was like this. Suddenly, the ring shrank and adjusted perfectly to Rey's finger size. The Duke explained that the ring was a creation of a dwarf, and was capable of much more than that. Rey expressed his thanks to the Duke, who told him not to worry. He was sure that even the dwarf who had made it would be glad that a saint was wearing his ring. The Duke was not yet done expressing his gratitude. After confirming that the saint and the saintess planned on heading to the Holy Empire after this or not, and offered to sponsor their entire trip so that it could be as comfortable as possible, both Rey and Ariel lit up instantly, their concern of funding for the journey vanished entirely. In the resting area, Ariel and Rey sat comfortably on the sofas and chatted among themselves. Rey was glad that everything worked out well in the end. He also found the duke to be a good guy, but Ariel thought otherwise, saying that that was his way of getting on their good side. Ray could only shake his head at this dark thinking. Before Ray could say anything, someone started knocking on the door to their room. Ray and Ariel were not expecting anyone to come at this time. When they opened the door, they found Hopal and Layla, the son and the daughter of the Duke standing outside. Hopal apologized first for visiting so late at night. They had heard that Ray and Ariel were going to leave for the Holy Empire the next morning so they came to meet. Hopal expressed his gratitude to the duo for everything they had done. Ray smiled awkwardly while Ariel returned the gratitude with a smile. Hopal then invited Ray and Ariel to join them for a picnic in the night garden. The stars when viewed from the garden behind the castle were very beautiful, and Layla wanted to show them the sight. Ariel and Ray both thought that it would be fun and agreed. 
Hopal and Layla were excited and left quickly to make the necessary preparations. As soon as they left, a chuckle escaped Ariel's mouth. When Ray asked what she found funny, she told him that no matter how she looked at it, this was a farewell party for them. She found it nice and cute. Since she had always been busy with the work assigned by the Holy Empire, people always seemed afraid of her. As such she never had the chance to form relationships. Ariel felt that the world had changed suddenly. It was a feeling she had never felt before, but she definitely did not hate it. Ray closed his eyes and thought about his first meeting with Ariel. She was cold and violent, blinded by her goals. Compared to that time, Ariel was like a new person now. Ray was sure that instead of the world changing, it was Ariel who had changed. In the garden behind the castle, the sky was filled with stars. On the grass lay a luxurious cloth with a candle and some snacks. As they sat down, Ray suddenly remembered something. He told Layla that she would have to avoid eating flour even after he left. If she were to eat flour again, her illness would return. Layla was shocked that she had not been fully healed. Ray explained that her body reacted to the chemicals in the flour as though they were poison, so it would be difficult to fully heal. He assured her that perhaps if she abstained from flour for five years, her condition might stabilize and she could eat flour again. Layla could not believe she could not eat flour for five whole years. She did not know how she could survive without eating bread for so long. Opal laughed, looking at his sister grieving, and changed the subject, saying that he had prepared something special for Ray and Ariel. He then gathered mana at the tip of his finger and pointed it at the sky, casting the spell light. Fireworks bloomed in the night sky, lighting up everything in a bright light. Everyone enjoyed the beautiful sight with gasps of admiration. Hopal shyly admitted that since this might be the last time they were going to see each other, he wanted to do everything he possibly could for them. Ray smiled, looking at the fireworks in the sky and said that he would return the favor. Under everyone's confused gaze he cast three spells simultaneously, light, explosion, and sparkle. The mana in the surrounding gathered and cackled, blooming into huge colorful explosions in the sky. Not just them, but even the maids of the castle or the duke, everyone enjoyed the beautiful sight. Layla and Hopal were impressed, they had gained an unforgettable memory. Ray was also glad that he could make such great memories with them. There was a time when he was shaken up. Due to the convenience of magic, he had denied his own aspirations. However, in the end he was able to reaffirm that his medicine really worked. Thanks to this, he was able to help someone and make such great memories and relationships. Ray was filled with more determination than ever to continue his journey and help as many people as he could. Finally Ray and the Holy Empire Dispatch Squad were headed to the Holy Empire of Gaia. Even though it was a long distance away, thanks to the Duke's support, they were able to smoothly make the journey. Not just that, the Dispatch Squad was already made aware that all of the support was only possible due to Ray. As time continued, Ray's status continued to improve. They had already been traveling for a few days now, and Ray was getting used to camping outside thanks to that. Just when he was wondering when they would be able to reach the Holy Empire, a voice called out to him. It was a group of people from the Dispatch Squad that were showing newfound interest in chess and wanted to learn a couple moves from Ray. Ray was surprised that there were so many people, but he was not one to shy away from a match. He was getting bored anyway. Besides, he did not plan to go easy on anyone, despite them being beginners. His devilish smile made cold sweat drip from the back of the dispatch squad members, making them nervous. They had a bad feeling about what was going to happen. And sure enough, that bad feeling was correct. Since the dispatch squad was unaware that Ray had entered world chess tournaments in the past, everyone lost to him within seven turns, some even as quick as four turns. Just like that, Ray was able to go undefeated and left a deep mark on everyone. Not only that, the dispatch squad's opinion of him improved vastly as well. With that, another day had passed. The next day, sitting inside the carriage, Ray asked Uriel whether the path was very rough. He felt like they were barely making progress on their journey. Uriel reassured him that it would get better once they got past the current area. The Holy Empire was also not far away now. Ray was glad to hear that. Just then, the carriage shook violently, surprising both Ray and Ariel. Outside the carriage, a dispatch squad member noticed the horde of ogres approaching and alerted everyone, rallying for everyone to get into battle positions. The voice also reached inside the carriage, and Ray and Ariel understood the situation. Ray wanted to help fight the monsters so that they could get back on the road faster, but Ariel told him that the knights could handle it themselves. Not to mention, if the saints were to move, everyone would have to readjust their positions to protect them. 
that would bring discourse among the ranks and cause even more issues. Outside the carriage, the knights fought against the ogres but were facing difficulties. The ogres were much stronger than normal, however they still had plenty of ways to deal with the horde. The squad leader Hario shouted the orders, readjusting the troops to protect the saint and the saintess. For a moment, his attention was diverted towards the carriage, and the ogre took advantage of that, throwing a punch at the unguarded Hario. The fist inched closer and closer, but before it could hit its intended target, a huge shield made of mana appeared and slammed into the ogre, disrupting the attack. After pushing the ogre back, Ray landed on the ground. It was a good idea that he decided to come outside, otherwise Hario would have died here. When Hario told Ray to get to safety because it was dangerous, Ray told him not to worry. He gathered mana in his hand and combined three spells into one, Earth Spear, Fire and Entangle. The spell moved towards the ogres with destructive power and completely obliterated all three of them. Harios had his jaw dropped at the sight. After gaining his bearing, he hurriedly thanked Ray for giving him his protection. Harios wondered how the saint could use such a potent magic spell. If he remembered correctly, the saint was around 15 years old only. Ray had managed to use the four circle spell Earth Spear with just the activation chant and even used Entangle and Fire at the same time. It was on par with five circle mages. Harios wondered if Ray had already achieved the six circle status, which no human had been able to achieve yet. Uriel, who had watched everything, humorously told Ray to stop showing off and spreading rumors of being a genius at magic. Looking at the burning corpse of the ogre, she realized that something was off. An ogre should not have been that strong. She said to start moving before any more monsters gathered here, but Ray pointed behind her, saying that it was already too late for that. Instead of ogres, this time a horde of goblins had appeared. Harios ordered the knights to swiftly take care of the goblins. The knight brandished his sword and charged at the goblin, hacking away. However, the goblin swiftly dodged the slash and clawed at the chest of the knight. The goblin was also very peculiar. It had managed to rip through the metal armor and injure the knight with just its claws. Such strength was unseen from the goblins. Looking at the situation, there was no choice but for the saints to step in themselves to resolve the problem. Uriel moved with quick steps, taking down one goblin after another in succession. Looking at her decimate the monsters with ease, Ray even suspected that her physical prowess surpassed his. One of the goblins jumped at Ray, thinking he had let his guard down but was instantly struck down by wind blades casted by Ray. No matter how many monsters they killed, there was no end to them. If it kept going like this, they would soon be overrun. They needed to find a way to take care of all the monsters at once. Ray suddenly had an idea. He shouted out loud, gaining the attention of all the goblins and made funny faces in an attempt to rile them up. Much to Ariel's surprise, the provocation worked and the goblins were angry and started chasing after Ray. Ray ran for a while before stopping at a distance far enough from the dispatch squad. He was surrounded by a horde of goblins larger than his expectations. He manipulated the mana and created a fireball the size of his hand. The goblins mocked Ray, laughing at the small fireball. However, they soon regretted it when multiple similar fireballs started appearing in the sky. Ray had prepared one for each of them. The goblins were left speechless. The fireballs descended one after another like rain, creating a chain of explosions. The shockwave from the explosions reached even the dispatch squad. Harios worried if the saint had been hurt and ran to confirm the situation. When he arrived at the location of the explosions, he saw a huge crater in the ground and was surprised. From the smoke emerged Ray, completely unharmed and told Harios to hurry up and prepare for departure again. They had a long way to go, and he did not want to deal with any more monsters now. At night when the dispatch squad stopped to rest, Ariel and Ray sat around a fireplace and chatted. Ray asked Ariel whether the monsters they had faced today were usually this strong. Ariel told him that the monsters around here were usually not that strong. That was the reason the dispatch squad got flustered and had trouble dealing with them. She then continued after hesitating for a while. If Ray went through the baptism, his mana would disappear. Ray was confused. He asked if the mana would completely disappear from his body. Ariel explained to him that if one went through baptism, they were given holy power by the god himself. However, the human body was only capable of storing one type of mana. Since holy power acted like mana, if the holy power were to enter the body with mana still present inside, the body would explode from the inside. That was why before holy power was granted, all the mana in the body was gradually removed and gradually replaced with holy power. 
As for the people who had no mana in the first place, the holy power would enter without any issues. When Ray asked about the magic circles, Uriel further explained that for an average person without any magic circles, God will create mana vessels within the body so that the saint could use holy power. Once that occurred, taboos would manage the mana that circulates through the body. Taboo was a term that the other saint coined. Just like how the saints could not go against the god, they also could not say or do anything that violated their faith. That was a taboo. Ariel laughed in a self-deprecating manner, finding it ironic that saints could not even say what they wanted to. Ray was surprised. He silently repeated her words in his mind and then asked what would happen if someone were to break the taboo. Since the taboo controlled the mana inside the body, the mana would disappear, along with the person disappearing forever from this world. It left a bad taste in Ray's mouth. It was basically a threat against anyone who dared to trash talk. Ariel just shook her head. She had heard about quite a few of the saints who had disappeared that way. That's why she had to make sure to always be on top of things. Ariel reassured Ray that it did not really apply to him so he did not have to worry about anything. Ray only needed to be prepared to lose the mana that he currently had. Ray wondered if the mana would ever regenerate, but Ariel poured cold water over his optimistic thoughts. Not only would he be unable to regenerate the mana, but the circle in the body will also lose its function. When Ariel saw that Ray felt a little disappointed, she tried to cheer him up by telling him the benefits of the holy power. Ray, on the other hand, was deep in thought. If it wasn't for the fact that his mana would disappear forever, he would have liked to be able to use holy power. But this was a deal breaker. He needed to find another way to go about it. The next morning, the dispatch squad finally reached the Holy Empire. Ray was glad that he had finally arrived at his destination. It had taken too long. Uriel requested the priest to head straight to Salonia, the capital of the Holy Empire. When Ray heard it, he felt resigned that they were already going to hold the ritual without even taking a break. Uriel told him that the ritual was not yet going to take place. The baptism ceremony was an event that was celebrated by everyone. However, as Ray was currently, he did not know anything about the Holy Empire and needed to learn as much as he could before the ritual. When Ray asked who his teacher would be, Ariel pointed at herself. From the small things like baptism to the bigger things like etiquettes, regulations, and the natural order, she was going to teach him everything. At the capital Salonia, Ray looked at the towering and magnificent mansion and was flabbergasted. It was even better than the castle in Silos. Earlier, he had been told by Ariel that all of the place was his. This was the estate where the saints resided. It was a sacred land that even the Pope needed permission to enter. Not to mention, even the people working inside had been specifically selected and were of status. Ariel told him that he would be staying here as he learned everything she had told him on the way here with a grin on her face. Ray could not deal with her cheeky behavior and was annoyed. He didn't understand why it had to be her. As he was walking in the mansion, he was greeted by a blue-haired girl wearing a maid dress. She told Ray that she would show him his room and to follow her. Ray was surprised by her charisma. Sure enough, it was like Ariel had said. She seemed to be of some status, her bearings were unlike an ordinary person. The maid led him to his room. The room was vast and luxuriously adorned, it was practically sparkling. Ray was naturally amazed by it. The maid told him to rest and left the room. Receiving treatment like royalty, it was starting to hit him that he had really become the saint. The next day, Ariel dressed sophisticatedly, acted like a teacher with a stick in her hand. Her enthusiasm was pissing Ray off. She told Ray to focus on the handout she had just handed him. But Ray stopped her, saying that he had already memorized everything. When Ariel did not believe him, Ray recited everything written in the handout for her. The baptism ceremony was going to be held over four days in three parts. The three parts were the greeting ceremony to God, the pilgrimage to announce the new saint, and finally receiving the holy power from God. The final step was going to be held in a holy place with the saint in isolation. Ray then recited the rules of the etiquette that the saint had to follow. He could not lower his head. He was only allowed to greet others using his left hand laid on his upper abdomen with his arm at a 70-degree angle. The main three table manners were to never make sounds while eating, to never lower one's head, and to always have the back straight with the elbows in front of the upper body. Ariel could not believe he had memorized all of that. It was not something a human could do. Ray understood everything but he had confusion about one thing. He did not know what exactly he needed to do in the third part of the ceremony. The handout did not say anything about what was supposed to happen and the only thing that was mentioned was to show sincerity to the god. Ray asked Ariel what she did when she went through the ceremony. He wanted to know for reference. Ariel replied that she did not do anything at all. 
Ray felt like she was joking with him but Ariel assured him that she just ate and slept for a week. After that, mana vessels appeared within her body and she could feel the holy power flowing through her body. Ray was still skeptical. It all seemed very mysterious to him. Ariel soon shifted gears. Even though Ray had memorized everything, she was sure that he could not have internalized everything so soon. Just memorizing something and actually doing it were two entirely different things. Since it was already mealtime, she challenged him to show her his manners at the table. Ray could only sigh and agree. He did not have a say in any of this. At the dinner table, Ray gracefully used the cutlery and ate his food with elegance. Ariel had to grudgingly admit that he was doing good. However, she was sure that he was going to slip up soon. She declared that she would definitely find his flaws. Ray felt like she was picking a fight. He asked her why she was acting so strict, but this was the moment she had been waiting for. Ariel was not slow to point out the fact that Ray had spoken with food still in his mouth. Ariel explained to him that the nitpicky nobles would notice everything Ray did, so she needed to make sure his conduct was perfect. Ray was tired of her bossing him around and told her to take a rest, but she was having too much fun to actually stop now. Her face said it all. At that moment, the blue-haired maid interjected into the conversation and addressed Ariel. She first apologized and then said that to have the saintess stay at the estate of the newly appointed saint would attract too much attention and also bring rumors about the two of them. She then added that she was only sharing her thoughts and did not wish to be rude. Ariel's intuition picked something. She asked the name of the maid, to which she introduced herself as Belacroix Euclidwood. Ariel instantly recognized the name Belacroix. It was one of the three noble families. Within the different noble families located within the Holy Empire, there were three families that served the saints. In addition to that, there were also six families that received the title of Je for their accomplishments. Ariel was curious why someone as important as her was selected as a servant at the saint's estate. Ariel agreed with Euclidwood that they needed to be careful. She then looked at the time and said that it was a good time to return for today. Before leaving, Ariel thanked Euclidwood for the advice, who only replied with the customary thanks. Ray repeated the name of the family silently in his mind, Belacroix. Since she had a title, he was sure that she was a noble. Ray was surprised that the saint even had nobles working as his servants. He realized that the position of the saint was more important than he initially thought. That night, in Ray's bedroom, Ray was sleeping peacefully when the door slightly opened, and Euclidwood entered the room. She stood over Ray and looked at him silently with a restrained dark aura around her. She was about to reach for his face but stopped herself and left after turning around. The next day, Ray took a sip of the tea and praised Euclidwood. He really liked the taste of the tea. It was a peaceful morning. Last night, Euclidwood entered Ray's room so quietly that even the sensitive Ray did not notice anything. However, she left the room without doing anything. Everyone acted peacefully as though nothing had happened. Ariel looked at Euclidwood with narrowed eyes, she did not have any proof, but her instincts found her suspicious. Unbeknownst to Ariel's sensitivity, and the truth, Ray simply enjoyed the tea with a blissful expression. A maid came close to Euclidwood and whispered something in her ears, who then addressed Ray, and told him that everything for the ritual was ready and asked him to follow her. Ray was under the impression that the ritual was going to be held in the afternoon so he did not understand why so early. Ariel told him that there was a lot to prepare before the ritual. After all, he had to impress a lot of people today. At the time of the ceremony, Ray arrived wearing his ceremonial outfit. Ariel praised his look, saying that the outfit looked good on him. Euclid would open the door for Ray, informing him that the Pope and the people were waiting for him. Ray felt nervous but he was prepared and determined. With the announcement, Ray walked with the cheers of the people through the passage. The spectators looking were surprised to see that the new saint was a kid. They felt like it was their chance to bring him to their side so they hurried to his side, introducing themselves. However, before they could finish, Ariel stepped between them and Ray. She told them off, asking them to wait until the ceremony was over as this was going against the proper etiquette preceding the ceremony. The people were scared at Ariel's firm tone and backed down. Euclidwood also made sure to tell them off, asking them to not behave rudely and to be courteous towards the saint. They immediately recognized her as the young lady of Hibiqua family and were surprised why she was wearing a maid outfit. In the end, they could do nothing and apologized before leaving. Euclidwood then led Ray to the next location and told him that once they arrived, he needed to share a couple of words with the people. Ray was surprised. It was his first time hearing about this. He understood Ariel's behavior from before now. She intentionally did not tell him anything about presenting a speech. However, both Euclidwood and Ariel reassured him and told him not to worry about it. 
The people always made their own interpretations so they told Ray to say whatever he wanted. Ray could only sigh and resign to his fate. He did not have any other choice in this case anyways. Before he left, Iriel made sure to wish him luck with a bright smile. Ray felt his nervousness dissolve and melt away. He planned on nailing his speech. Facing the huge crowd, Ray wondered if the whole empire had gathered for the ritual. Euclid would handed him a magic tool that amplified and projected the user's voice to reach much farther but Ray refused it as he did not need it. He gathered mana in his hand and cast a wide-range spell instantly to do the work of the magic tool. Euclidwood was surprised to see Ray suddenly use magic for the first time in front of her. Addressing all the people, Ray started speaking. Ray first greeted everyone and then introduced himself as the newly appointed saint. He said that he was an ordinary boy that grew up in the countryside of this nation. Even then he was selected as the saint. He then made a promise to everyone, a promise to make sure the Holy Empire becomes a force at the pinnacle of the continent. Ray waved his hand as he spoke, causing a giant meteor to appear in the sky. The audience was flabbergasted. More than being concerned about their safety, they were more amazed that the saint had used a nine-circle magic, which meant that the saint was a grand magician. Ray ended his speech with an impactful promise and the crowd began chanting his name, amazed by both his fear and words. With a snap of his finger, Ray cancelled the metro as it disappeared from the sky and turned around, asking Euclidwood to lead him to the next destination. Euclidwood brought him to a secluded space with an altar in the middle surrounded by flowers. She instructed Ray to lay down on the altar. Once he felt that he was spiritually ready, he could ask for an audience with God. Ray did not understand much, but followed the instructions. He didn't really know what to say. He tried greeting God and calling him multiple times but ended up dozing off. By the time he woke up, the sun was already setting. The so-called God never appeared for him. And not just that, his back also hurt from sleeping on a hard surface. Ray looked around only to find Euclidwood standing still in the same position as she was before he went to sleep. Ray found it ridiculous and thought that she must have gotten tired. In the end, he decided to get up and be done with it, both because his back hurt and for Euclidwood's sake. When Euclidwood asked if God had spoken to Ray, he pretended to have heard the voice of God. Euclidwood was impressed and remarked that even Ariel took a whole day for this process. She praised Ray, who felt guilty and contemplated telling her the truth and coming clean, but ultimately decided against it. At the same time as the celebration of a new saint appearing in the Holy Empire, trouble was brewing in the shadows. The appearance of the new saint spelled a change of plans for the forces of the dark. But no matter what, they had to ensure that the Holy Empire crumbled, by any means necessary. All the nobles, who had set their eyes on the ritual of the new saint, were surprised to hear that the saint had already completed the ritual. At the same time, Marquis Harold called for his son. The new saint was an archmage who could summon a meteor. He needed to make sure to get on his good side in advance. When his son arrived, he advised him that this was their chance. Even though they had missed their chance with the saintess, if they could get acquainted with the new saint, they would be able to strengthen their family's influence in the Holy Empire. Marquis Harold told his son to get along with the saint in the banquet, and to treat him with utmost respect to make sure he did not get on his bad side. The Marquis eldest son Berith voiced his understanding. However, he did not seem to pay much attention to the instructions of his father. He thought that the saint was just a country bumpkin and wondered how to play around with him. In the banquet hall, Berith stood with his colleagues and chatted about the rumors surrounding the saint. The rumor being that the saint was a commoner and not a noble. Thrill and his colleague Grayan mocked the saint for being a commoner and laughed. However, soon their attention shifted to another person that had entered the banquet hall. It was Zeke of the Trey Duchy. He was famous for never attending even a single banquet before. Barith wondered why he had suddenly decided to make an appearance. When Barith welcomed Zeke, Zeke just sighed in disregard and said that he had not come to see his sorry face. Sarith, another one of Barith's friends, stepped up and asked Zeke who he was looking for. Zeke looked around and realized that the saint still had not arrived yet. After confirming that, he walked past Barith who had proposed for them to wait for the saint together, completely ignoring him. Barith was left with anger and embarrassment at being ignored and could only swear at Zeke in his mind. Ray, who was getting ready for the banquet, marveled at the attire he had worn. Not only was it extremely comfortable, it also felt like it was tailor-made according to his measurements. Euclidwood, with an expressionless face, acknowledged the fact that it was indeed made to precisely fit his measurements. She had estimated his measurements on the day he arrived and had sent them to the tailor. Ray was surprised that she could pin down his measurements just by estimation alone. 
He thought that she was very special and cool, and praised her skills with a very bright smile. Euclid would on the other hand kept the same expressionless expression on her face and thanked him, asking him to follow her to the banquet hall. Faced with the indifference and lack of emotion, Ray could only laugh awkwardly. He sometimes really felt like Euclid was a machine. In the banquet hall, chatter was growing about the saint being late. The topic shifted towards the amazing feat of the saint in the ritual as well as the impressive speech of the saint. Barith did not seem to take these seriously. In his mind he had already established that the saint was a mere commoner. Finally with the announcement, Ray entered the banquet hall, adorning his formal attire that was a mixture of white and gold. The people were surprised to see the saint for the first time. The confidence and the calm composure, they found everything about him to be perfect. Barith stepped forward and introduced himself as the eldest son of the Marquis Herald, and Ray returned the greeting politely. At the same time, others also stepped forward and introduced themselves to Ray. Barith, who had been observing Ray closely, could not find any flaws to comment on. At this rate, his plans to humiliate the saint would be sabotaged. Barith felt like he was left with no choice but to strike first to get the upper hand. He addressed Ray in front of everyone and asked if he used to be a commoner before becoming a saint. Ray immediately understood why type of person he was. However, he replied normally, as though nothing was wrong. Ray understood that there were always people like this. Such people could not compete with what they had, yet they could not stand to just watch quietly from the sidelines. So they acted all nonchalant, trying to get involved in the politics of things. Such people were worse than trash. Ray decided to deal with him appropriately. He asked Barith why he believed status to determine one's worth. These types of people usually had one thing in common, the Davy that they would end up digging their own graves as they continued to talk. Barith was similar, he said that it was common logic. His words lost direction as he tried to explain the logic, and ended up calling Ray worthless. However, before he could finish his sentence, a sword cleaved through the air at an impressive speed, intending on separating Barith's head from his body. Ray focused Mana at his fingertips and managed to stop the sword right before it made contact with Barith's neck. Barith was scared out of his mind. Ray was about to reprimand Zeke who had tried to behead Barith, but Zeke fell down to his knees before Ray could finish his sentence and apologized profusely to him. He did not want this to be Ray's first impression of them. Ray was pretty surprised by the strange turn of events. Euclid would join in the conversation as well, saying that Barith had done blasphemy by overstepping his bounds and trying to make a fool out of Ray. Zeke agreed with Euclid wholeheartedly, and believed that Barith's throat needed to be cut and his family needed to be punished. They needed to set an example. Ray agreed with Euclid and asked her to call Marquis Harold. At that moment, Ariel came into the picture with Marquis Harold. The Marquis had been watching everything happen from the second floor and had a devastated expression on his face. The Marquis hurried to his eldest son and started beating him instantly, calling him curses. Everyone looking at this happening was not sure how to react. After beating up his son, Marquis Harold got on his knees and begged Ray for forgiveness. He also made his son apologize to Ray. Ray calmed down Zeke and Euclid who were ready to pounce on the father and the son, and fell into thought. Instead of handing out the verdict, Ray asked the Marquis what he thought the appropriate punishment was for what they had done. The Marquis remembered the past, about how his son had lost his mother at a young age, and felt sorry towards him for having failed as a father. He had promised himself to make sure his son lived the best life he could, but somewhere along the way, he seemed to have failed. After thinking for a while, he decided that as an apology and a sign of his regret, he would renounce his title and donate all his fortune to the temple. When Ray said that the matter could be resolved with only punishing Barith, the Marquis disagreed. He said that a parent had to take responsibility for the actions of their child. Ray was impressed by the Marquis, who was ready to lose everything to protect his son. He called Barith and asked him what sin he had committed. Barith replied with fear that he had committed blasphemy against the saint. Ray corrected him that his biggest sin today was making his father get on his knees. If the Marquis was the same as his son, Ray would have punished them, but there did not seem to be a need for that. In the end he decided to forgive them. Everyone including Zeke and Euclid were surprised. Marquis Harold was even moved to tears. Ray wondered if completely forgiving them was too much, and decided to order them to donate generously to the temple. The Marquis and Barith expressed their gratitude to Ray zealously. Ariel, who had been watching everything with interest, could only laugh at the situation. Ray had given such a light punishment for something as severe as blasphemy. 
However, it was not expected when she thought about his personality. A heartfelt smile could not help but form on her face. After the banquet, Ray stood in the garden, looking at the night sky full of stars. Standing besides him, Zeke asked him if he wanted to take care of the father and son pair. He was more than eager to dispose of them at any moment. Ray calmed him down, feeling no need to go that far. It was only then that he realized that Zeke had been following him around for a while. It was so natural that he did not even find it strange at all. When Ray asked him for his name, Zeke fell down to his knees in an instant, vehemently apologizing for the oversight. Ray could not believe such a person. Still kneeling down and bowing his head, Zeke introduced himself as Treja Zeke of the Trey Duchy. Ray found it strange for him to also have Je as the middle name. Yukli would explain to him that Je was a title. The only people that had the title Je in their name were the three families that served the saint and the saintess. It was a symbol of their loyalty to him. Ray understood it finally. He found it ridiculous that there were three families. He did not need that many people to serve him. In fact, just one was fine. Yukli would told Ray not to feel pressured and just take it as God's will. After all, the system has been passed down since ancient times. Zeke on the other hand begged Ray to keep him as the only one if three were too many. Yukli would instantly snapped at him for trying to kick her out. Ray had to first calm them down so they did not fight. He then inquired about the third family. Only Zeke and Euclidewood had appeared in front of him. Euclidewood explained that the third family was in charge of protecting him from the shadows. Their true identity was unknown even to the Holy Empire, and nobody knew who they were. However, it was confirmed that they are always within the proximity necessary to protect the saint in an instant. Ray was surprised and immediately focused on his surroundings. After focusing, he could finally feel their presence through sensing their mana. Ray counted a total of seven people hiding close to him and was shocked. Zeke and Euclidewood could not sense anyone around them. The members of the third family that were hiding in the shadows were impressed. It was the first time someone had been able to sense their presence, let alone the fact that it was by such a young saint. The next morning, in the mansion, the rays of the sun filtered through the glass windows and illuminated the intricate designs on the walls. Euclidewood gazed at the insignia on the wall and remembered her past. She remembered the harsh training her father put her through to serve the saint. Holding the sword tightly with blood staining her hands, she wondered why she was suffering through so much. There had never been a case where two saints existed at the same time. Even that there was already a saintess, there was not supposed to be another saint in this generation. However, in order to serve the saint that did not even exist, she had to train hard. She used to question the purpose of her existence hundreds of times a day. But a few years later, as if God was answering her prayers, a new saint was chosen. Euclidewood was brought out of her reverie by Ray calling her. Ray inquired why Ariel was the one leading him to the next part of the ritual. Meanwhile, Ariel had a smug expression and said that the prettiest person was supposed to guide the saint to the next part. Euclidewood explained that except for special occasions, only saints could enter the location of the ritual. She made sure to emphasize the fact that it had nothing to do with appearance. Like a child that had been caught playing a prank, Ariel struck out her tongue and laughed while Ray could only shake his head. Ariel led Ray through the forest behind the castle and they soon arrived at their destination. The place was guarded by holy knights and made Ray wonder if something important was hidden here. After a little walking, they reached the entrance. With a playful tone, Ariel told Ray that he only needed to climb all the way to the top. Ray looked at the never-ending flight of stairs and found it ridiculous. Ariel was practically gleaming as she put the cherry on the top, and said that as part of the ceremony to show respect to the god, Ray could not use mana at all. The sun was setting in the sky. Ray called out to Ariel, asking to take a short break, but Ariel playfully mocked him, saying that he needed to build up his stamina. Compared to Ray who was sweating and out of breath, Ariel seemed like she was out on a casual walk. In Ray's defense, he had been going all over the Holy Empire all day yesterday and was already tired. Not to mention, if he could use mana, the climb would be a piece of cake for him. However, Ariel shut down that idea quickly. Not only could Ray not use it on the path, but he was also not to use any mana at the site of the ritual either. After informing Ray of everything, Ariel bid him luck and left. From here on out, Ray had to make the rest of the trip on his own. Ray looked down at the path he had come from. The starting point could not even be seen from how high up he had climbed. After another strenuous climb, Ray finally managed to reach the top and instantly collapsed on the floor. He was a hot mess, covered in sweat all over. At least, in the clearing in front of him, a nice cottage stood. Ray thought it would be just an empty clearing, but he was glad that he was wrong. 
Ray opened the door to the house and put down his bag. His goal was to stay for a week in this place and do nothing. In other words, this was like a vacation for him. Ray was now determined to get as much rest as he could in the following week. However, he did not know at the time that the trials awaiting him were not so simple. Ray plucked an apple from the tree and bit into it. The apple may be fresh, but he was sick of eating apples by now. Not just that, he was sick of living in the mountains. He made sure not to use mana for anything, but that forced him to do things manually. He had to light a fire or catch fish by hand. Not just that, he was told to stay in the mountain for a week, but a whole month had passed and he had heard no words, neither from God nor from anyone else. Ray was livid and shouted at the sky. He was not there to learn how to survive in a jungle. It was only when he shouted with anger that Ray felt the surroundings change. The golden holy power gathered around Ray, lifting him off the ground and entered his body. Ray was glad that he could finally use holy power, but he did not know the reality of the things were way different. As soon as the holy power settled inside his body, all the holy power left. Ray did not understand why this was happening. The holy power moved again and entered Ray's body, however the next moment it was dispersed again. The same cycle repeated again. Ray felt like God was playing a prank on him. The God on the other hand was also speechless. This time, a ray of holy power shot down from the sky, straight on Ray, but it also proved to be unsuccessful. Ray was depressed as he headed down the mountain. He went through so much and yet received no holy power. The holy power tried to enter his body again, but Ray refused to let it do so. There was no point in it if it was just going to leave his body again soon after. Ray could only sigh in disappointment at the outcome. At the bottom of the stairs, Ray saw Ariel waiting for him and was instantly touched. It was the first person he had seen within a month so it only made sense for him to be emotional. All Ariel could see on the other hand was Ray's silhouette shrouded completely in a golden light. When Ray explained everything to Ariel, she told him to try using mana to see if he could use it. The ritual was over now so he was allowed to use mana as he pleased. Ray then asked Ariel about her clothes. She was dressed in a plain and casual attire that was dirty. Ariel explained that she sensed strong holy power and came in a hurry so she did not have any time to change clothes. Ray cast a clean spell on her clothes, and it worked. At least, Ray could still use his mana. Ray wondered why he could not control the holy power. Even though he could control the mana in the air, Ariel tried to cheer him up. She told him that he was still someone chosen by God, not to mention an incredible mage, so he did not need to worry about it much. She then closed the distance between them and sniffed him. Due to the lingering holy power, the air around him felt very pleasant and smelled good too. Ray was weirded out by this and decided to keep a distance from people until he could control the holy power. As Ray left the testing area, Zeke and Euclidewood, who were waiting for him, congratulated Ray for completing the ritual. Ray was also glad to see them and thank them for coming. As the two of them caught a whiff of the lingering holy power, they also immediately changed demeanors and tried to close the distance between them and Ray. Ray realized that something was wrong with them and made extra sure to keep his distance from them. At nighttime in his mansion, Ray put down a large stack of books on the table and started studying them. When he became a saint, he had promised himself one thing, to make the holy empire the greatest. And now that he had officially become the saint, it was time to honor that promise. The first step in his plan was to learn everything about the holy empire, and to understand it all, he had to read up. Ray was sure that in order to make the holy empire the greatest, a new system needed to be introduced. Ray had all the nobles of the holy empire gathered when the sun was shining brightly. The gathered nobles criticized the inefficiencies that the Holy Empire had faced, and in response, Ray suggested adjustments for the agriculture, commerce, and trading industries. Among those adjustments, the Milpa solar system for the agriculture industry received overwhelming support from the nobles and was the first to be adopted. All of Ray's propositions received good reception. However, the idea of using the priests as mercenaries for hire raised some questions from the nobles. Ray was prepared for them. Count Grain found the notion of sending the priests into battle to be unacceptable. He thought that the resulting deaths of the priests would lead to the fall of the Holy Empire. On top of that, the number of people aiming to become priests would decrease as well. Ray understood that a battlefield was not a safe place. First, he was not forcing all of the priests to head into the battlefield. Second, he also planned to send paladins alongside them to the battlefield. That way their safety was ensured. Not only that, it would also be a great experience for the priests involved. Ray explained that using the priests as mercenaries was not only for money and honor, 
in reality, those were just the bonuses that came along with it. What they were asking for was the support from the other nations. With the interest from the nobles peaked, Ray explained his strategy. From the perspective of the nations that need help from the Holy Empire, they would be unable to do anything that put the Empire in danger. Not to mention since they were only lending their forces, they could ask for compensation in cases where casualties occurred. The nobles could now see the benefit, but they were still hesitant as they found the idea too dangerous. The only thing they needed to be convinced was a push. Ariel stepped in at this time and declared to support the saint's idea. Earlier, Ariel had told Ray that gaining the approvals of the nobles would be a difficult endeavor. However, there was one simpler way that was her help. They did not need to win the favor of the nobles, they just needed to overcome it. The only thing she needed was to hear him beg her for help and call her the greatest beauty of the Holy Empire. Ray had no other choice. Ariel's influence was extraordinary. It was not an exaggeration to say that all the central nobles were her supporters. If Ariel supported Ray, nobody would be able to object. Sure enough, thanks to Ariel's declaration, all the opposition died down and Ray finished up with the meeting, getting his every plan approved. The Holy Empire slowly completed things as planned. Given that it was hard to change how agriculture was done so suddenly on a large scale, they first tested things with a small corner of a territory. The general public was also not against the idea of using priests as mercenaries. After receiving positive opinions from the priests themselves who were utilized, many nations soon asked for assistance from the mercenary priests. As such the empire was able to collect plenty of funds, resulting in the reinvestment into agriculture and commerce, allowing the holy empire to grow. In the library, Eclay remarked that it was odd to see so many people in the library. The librarian told her that it was because the saint had been coming here for the past few days, so others were also swarming here to see him. When Eclay looked around, she saw the white-haired bespectacled man reading books with a somber expression and realized that all of them had fallen for his face. Eclay sat down in front of Ray and noticed that all the books he was reading were related to medicine. She was suddenly curious if the saint actually understood them all so she asked Ray how one should treat a cut from a rusted sword. Ray was a little confused as to why this person was asking him, but the question was elementary for him. He said that to cure the patient, he would cut around the portion of the flesh that's been poisoned. Ray explained that getting cut by a rusted sword did not mean you were poisoned. Instead the wound and the surrounding cells get infected. Thus it was best to cut around the part that could not be perfectly healed using holy cure and then use heal. The clay was very pleased to hear Ray's response and invited him to her library so that they could have a deeper conversation. She then introduced herself as Eclay, the manager of the strong-headed priests. Ray immediately recognized the name and linked it to a title. He was surprised that the person sitting in front of him was the chief priest Eclay. The chief priest expressed his excitement about meeting Ray for the first time and mentioned that he had heard plenty about him from others. He offered Ray the opportunity to ask any questions about medicine if he had any on his mind. Despite grappling with why a saint like Ray would be interested in studying in an efficient field, after a moment of contemplation, Ray asked the chief priest why he, too, seemed to be studying medicine if he considered it inefficient. The chief priest, Eclay, brushed aside the hair covering one of his eyes and revealed his eye that had lost sight, explaining that the reason he studied medicine was to cure his eyes. Ray, intrigued, asked Eclay if the eye with the unusual condition was the one he was born with. Impressed by Ray's calm demeanor despite witnessing such an unusual condition, Eclay confirmed that indeed, his eye had been like that since birth. Ray, showing more concern, inquired if Eclay couldn't see at all from that eye and if he experienced any pain. Eclay explained that while he couldn't see anything at all, he didn't feel any pain. Respectfully, Ray asked if he could take a closer look, to which Eclay agreed without objections. After closely inspecting it, Ray identified it as cataracts. Surprised, Eclay admitted he had never heard of it before. Continuing his inquiries, Ray asked if Eclay could see better at night. Eclay agreed, mentioning that evenings did feel clearer. This revelation confirmed to Ray that it was indeed cataracts. To explain cataracts more clearly, Ray drew a diagram of the human eye from the inside, explaining how the lens focuses light and allows clear vision, which wasn't happening in Eclay's case. In Eclay's eye, the lens was a bit cloudy, and the disease causing it to be cloudy is cataracts. Surprised, Eclay asked Ray if it's just a disease, then it should be fixable using magic. Ray expressed doubts, saying that since Eclay was born with it, it might not be healed with just magic. Perplexed, Eclay asked what that had to do with the magic not working. 
To help Akle understand, Ray explained that holy magic works by identifying irregularities in the body and healing them. However, if the body doesn't recognize a birth defect as an irregularity, the magic won't work. Persistently, the clay asked if it wasn't already irregular that he couldn't see with his eye. Ray clarified that while it may seem irregular to others since the clay was born with it, his body might not recognize it as a problem. Ray told the clay that the only way to cure it is to clear the lens off his eye. When Eclay asked how they were going to do that, Ray explained that they would have to carve into it. Eclay's jaw dropped to the ground, horrified at the thought of someone carving into his eye to cure his eyesight, likening it to spoiling his blood. But Ray assured him that it was just one part of the treatment process. The first step would be to remove the cloudy lens and substitute it with something else. However, Ray hit a dead end there. While it was possible to carve into his eye, there was no artificial lens available in their world. So even if they treated the cataracts, there would be no point if Eclay couldn't get another artificial lens to see. Despite Eclay's reassurances and smiles, Ray was deeply shaken by the realization that, despite being a miracle doctor, he couldn't treat a simple cataract case in their world. However, fueled by newfound determination, Ray promised Eclay that he would cure his eye no matter what. After a brief pause, Eclay laughed and called Ray funny, then invited him to a place he wanted to show him. He led Ray to his lab, where he conducted various experiments in his free time for his research. Although the lab was created by the Holy Empire for Eclay to study medicine, he generously offered Ray to use it freely whenever he wanted. Eclay told Ray that letting him use the lab was the least he could do after Ray had shown such eagerness to treat his eye. Ray was overjoyed with excitement and thanked Eclay profusely for his generosity. With that, Ray began rearranging things in Eclay's lab. Over the course of a month, Ray visited the lab regularly, working on various experiments. One day, while carrying out his usual tasks, Ray had a thought. He took samples of the troll's blood in a test tube and poured it into a dish. After making contact with the dish, the blood quickly displayed malleable characteristics, solidifying into a jelly-like substance. Excitedly, Ray realized that different monsters' blood might possess different properties, which could be useful for their research. However, he also pondered the challenge of mixing blood from different species. Eclay agreed, noting that mixing blood from different species could be impossible or fatal due to incompatible body compositions. However, he mentioned an exception, orcs. Because of their remarkable adaptability, it might be possible to mix orc blood with others without adverse effects. Ray began contemplating ways to put this theory to the test and see if it held true in practice. After gathering the essential herbs he needed, Ray packed his bag and prepared to leave the forest when he suddenly sensed a presence nearby. Approaching cautiously, he discovered an orc and a troll, both unconscious. It appeared they had been engaged in a fierce battle and had mortally wounded each other, but to Ray's surprise, the orc was still clinging to life, though severely injured with a deep cut on its stomach, bleeding profusely, and slipping into shock. Recalling Eclay's words about orc blood's high adaptability, Ray couldn't help but smile at the perfect opportunity to test their theory. With a sense of urgency, he decided to transfer some of the troll's blood into the orc's body, hoping it might help save its life. Carefully, he performed the transfusion, watching anxiously for any signs of improvement. After some time, the orc stirred and opened its eyes, clearly shocked by its condition. Frightened and growling, the orc attempted to move, but Ray urged it to stay still. When the orc didn't comply, Ray used his binding magic to immobilize the creature, ensuring it couldn't move its muscles. With a gentle smile, Ray reassured the frightened orc that he was only trying to save its life. As Ray continued to administer the transfusion, he noticed something peculiar about the wound on the orc's chest. Instead of the usual red blood, a clear, colorless fluid was oozing from it. Intrigued, Ray realized that this must be a result of the mixture of orc and troll blood. Excitedly, a breakthrough dawned upon him. He realized that this combination could potentially lead to a solution for his previous dilemma. With a burst of enthusiasm, Ray exclaimed that he could finally achieve what he had been striving for using this innovative technique. Filled with hope and determination, Ray believed that with enough research, he might be able to create an artificial lens and ultimately cure Clay's eye condition. His immediate task was to gather more troll and orc blood for his experiments. Seeking guidance, he asked Eclay where he could find these creatures to study. After some thought, Eclay directed Ray to a small abandoned village called Jehel, situated near the outer wall of the castle. He explained that near the surrounding fortress was an area where trolls and orcs were known to roam, and encounters with troops were common. 
following Eclay's directions, Ray headed towards Jehel. However, upon arriving, Ray was taken aback to find the village completely in ruins. Despite Eclay's earlier warning that the place was abandoned, Ray hadn't expected it to be so desolate. Amidst the ruins, he spotted two children sitting in a corner, and his heart went out to them. Wondering if they too had been abandoned by their parents, Ray approached them and offered them food. The older sibling, a protective brother, instinctively shielded his younger sister, wary of potential harm. Ray reassured them that the food was safe and that he meant no harm. Slowly, the little boy decided to trust Ray and accepted the food. Ray felt a pang of sympathy for the children, knowing that the help he could offer them was limited to providing food and some money. He handed them a bag filled with sparkling gold and silver coins, instructing them to use it to find shelter and sustenance in Salonia. The children were astonished by his generosity, unable to comprehend why a stranger would be so kind to them. With a gentle chuckle, Ray assured them that there was no ulterior motive behind his actions. He simply wanted to help. Puzzled but grateful, the children thanked him and departed, leaving Ray with a sense of concern for their well-being. Aware that the current laws of the country offered little assistance to orphans, Ray resolved to investigate further upon his return. Surveying the abandoned yet beautiful buildings around him, Ray envisioned restoring Jehel to its former glory, envisioning a revitalized holy empire. As he continued exploring the area in search of what he needed, night fell, and the next morning, he stumbled upon the entrance to a troll's cave. Mindful not to disturb the slumbering trolls, Ray smirked mischievously as he prepared to borrow some blood from them using a syringe. After successfully obtaining blood from the trolls using his binding magic, Ray ventured to the orc territory to seek their assistance. However, upon his arrival, the orcs were hostile and ready to attack him. Using his binding magic once again, Ray immobilized them, urging them to listen to him calmly. He reminded them of the previous encounter where he had saved an orc's life and pleaded for their cooperation, asking to borrow some blood for his research with the promise of repayment. With the blood secured, Ray made his way back to the city to organize his findings. Suddenly, the same little girl whom he had helped the previous night appeared before him, tears streaming down her face as she gestured towards a certain direction. Though he couldn't understand her words, Ray sensed that something was amiss and decided to follow her. Arriving at the scene, Ray witnessed the girl's brother being beaten by a giant man who had stolen all the money Ray had given them earlier. Despite his small stature and obvious vulnerability, the boy bravely stood up to the giant, demanding the return of their stolen money. As the bad guys grew angrier, the leader attempted to strike the boy with a wooden weapon, but Ray intervened, stopping the attack with just one hand. He questioned the man's actions, prompting a growling response demanding to know who Ray was. Realizing the man had stolen the little boy's money, Ray glanced at the bag in his hand, confirming his suspicions. One of the thugs, judging from Ray's attire, assumed he came from a wealthy background but cautioned him against venturing alone into their territory. To teach Ray a lesson for interfering, the leader ordered his men to attack him. Despite their outnumbering, Ray effortlessly defended himself. Reacting swiftly, he punched one assailant in the face without even glancing back, shocking the leader with his unexpected strength. With a stern voice, Ray questioned if they wished to continue the fight, his contempt evident. Panicked, the leader commanded his men to attack Ray together, but their efforts were futile against their formidable opponent. Within minutes, they lay defeated and exhausted on the ground. Approaching the children, Ray ensured they were unharmed and apologized for what they had endured. He then offered them to follow him, knowing of a safe place where they could stay for the time being. Ray's attempt to bring the children to the Holy Empire was met with rejection as they were informed that only previous saints and their staff members were allowed to reside there. Despite his protestations, citing his authority as a current saint, the lady in charge remained firm, explaining that the rules did not permit the children's presence. Disheartened by the strict regulations, Ray reassured the children not to worry, promising to find them another place to stay. He purchased a house specifically for them and led them there, asking if they would be happy to reside in their new home. However, when he inquired about their names, the boy revealed that they didn't have any names. Ray's heart went out to the children, realizing they had been deprived of even the simplest of identities. Determined to provide them with a sense of belonging, he resolved to give them names himself, symbolizing a fresh start in their new life. Moved by the children's gratitude and touched by their reaction, Ray felt a sense of warmth and fulfillment as he decided to name them Mary and Chris. He explained the significance of the names and asked if they liked them. Surprised and puzzled, the children looked at him, prompting Ray to nervously laugh, 
and ask if they didn't like the names, quickly denying any dislike. Mary expressed his gratitude through teary eyes, explaining that Ray's kindness meant more to them than words could express. They had longed for love and compassion all their lives, and Ray's generosity filled a void they had felt for so long. Ray embraced them tenderly, assuring them that they were safe now and wouldn't face any more struggles. With the matter settled, Ray returned to his lab, ready to resume his research on the blood he had gathered. Despite the challenges and setbacks he had faced, Ray's heart was filled with a newfound sense of purpose and compassion, knowing that he had made a positive difference in Mary and Chris's lives. After settling the matter with the kids, Ray decided to go back to the lab to start his research on the material he gathered in the forest. The clay, curious about Ray's activities, asked him what he was doing. Excitedly, Ray explained to a clay that all his efforts were aimed at curing his eye. With a shout of excitement, he revealed the lens he had created all by himself. When Eclay asked if he was still determined to fix his eye, Ray nodded vigorously. Showing Eclay a tube containing the ingredients, Ray assured him that these were what he would use to fix his eye. Puzzled, Eclay asked about the contents and their source. Ray revealed that it was the troll's blood, which surprised Eclay, prompting him to question why it was so clear. Ray explained that he had mixed it with orc blood, clarifying that orcs could adapt to anything, as Eclay had mentioned. Through experimentation, Ray had discovered that by mixing troll and orc blood, they could produce a clear, malleable solution suitable for manipulation. Ray urged Eclay to trust the process, assuring him that he would indeed fix his eye using this method. With determination and confidence, Ray embarked on his mission to restore Eclay's eyesight. Ray's announcement that he intended to put the lens he made onto Eclay's eye came as a shock to her once again. She sought clarification, noting that Ray had previously mentioned the need to remove the cataract. Ray calmly explained that they would cut out the affected portions of the lens and replace them with the newly created one. Aware that Eclay would need time to process this unconventional procedure, Ray bowed before her, causing her to become flustered at the sight of a saint bowing to her. Unfazed, Ray acknowledged Eclay's hesitation, understanding how unconventional his proposal sounded. He urged her to trust him just this once, assuring her that he would fix her eye no matter what. The clay couldn't help but feel the sincerity in Ray's words. She recognized that his intentions were pure, and all he wanted was to fix her eye. Despite the seemingly crazy nature of the plan, she agreed to trust him, acknowledging that even a glimmer of hope was worth pursuing. With the clay's consent, Ray proceeded with the procedure. Using his hand, he kept her eyelid open, lacking any modern medical tools for assistance. After making the incision in the lens, he carefully removed the affected areas and inserted the artificial lens in its place. Despite the lack of medical equipment, Ray successfully completed the procedure, driven by the necessity to succeed. After some time, Eclay woke up and opened her eyes, astonished to find that she could see light with the eye that had been useless before. She looked out the window and was mesmerized by the colors she saw with both her eyes. The sun's rays illuminated the window, creating a serene spectacle. Excitedly, Ray approached her and asked if she could see clearly. Despite her tears of joy, Eclay confirmed that she could now see perfectly with both eyes. Overwhelmed with happiness, Ray joined her at the window, taking in the beauty of the bright day together. In another part of the castle, a knight came running to Saint Iriel, visibly out of breath, to deliver urgent news. He informed her that a large force had gathered on the border and was currently advancing towards the Holy Empire. Surprised and alarmed, Iriel asked for more details, questioning who was coming to attack and how far they had progressed. The knight, still catching his breath, explained that he had just received the news and didn't have many details. However, the force did not seem to belong to any specific nation, and they were being led by a necromancer accompanied by an army of undead. Shocked by this revelation, Iriel's expression shifted to one of disbelief. The air around them seemed to grow heavy with the presence of evil as the undead army advanced, withering the flowers and trees in their path with their overwhelming aura. As the ominous force continued its march towards the Holy Empire, a sense of uncertainty loomed over everyone. No one had anticipated such an event, and they were still unsure of what had triggered it. As the Holy Empire geared up for the final battle against the army of undead, a vast army of knights assembled on the border, ready to charge into the battlefield. The Holy Knight rallied their spirits, reminding them that tomorrow would mark the beginning of the decisive battle. Strategizing their attack, he ordered the paladins to take the front lines, with the guardians and knights protecting the rear. 
he emphasized the importance of mental preparedness as many lives depended on their actions. Amidst the preparations, one knight nervously confided to another about his disbelief at facing the army of the undead. Another knight, with a somber expression, shared his thoughts about cherishing memories of his family in such trying times. They discussed the regret they felt for not spending more time with their loved ones, now facing the uncertainty of returning alive from the battlefield. Rumors circulated among the knights that the new saint would join them in combat, albeit arriving four days later from Salonia. Now, their hopes rested on holding the line until the saint's arrival, a realization that brought a sense of disappointment and apprehension. Silently, they prayed for strength and guidance, hoping that the divine would be with them on the battlefield. Iriel sat in her office when a servant delivered the news that the Pope had ordered the saint to be sent to the border to join the battle. Concern etched across Iriel's face as she contemplated the gravity of the situation, realizing the seriousness of the threat for the Pope to make such a decree. She inquired about reinforcements from nearby nations, hoping for additional support. The assistant informed her that requests for reinforcements had been made, but due to the distance, it would take several days for them to reach the battlefield. Iriel pressed further, asking who would accompany the saint on the journey to the battlefield. The assistant replied that the third paladin order, the holy altar, and the royal guardsmen would travel alongside the saint. With this information, Iriel understood the weight of the situation and the importance of their mission. The reinforcements were currently en route to the border. Iriel's shock was palpable as she asked the assistant if the troops accompanying the saint were all they had. The assistant's silence spoke volumes, confirming her fears that the situation was even more dire than she had anticipated. In a fit of anger, she shouted at him, questioning if the Pope had lost his senses. Facing a necromancer from the age of sorcery with such a small force seemed like a foolhardy decision. But what exactly was the age of sorcery? In the distant past, magic was the subject of intense research, and the entire continent was flourishing with magical innovations. However, dark forces that wielded forbidden magic ultimately brought an end to that age of prosperity. Among them, the king of the necromancers was considered the primary catalyst for their downfall. Now, somehow, he had managed to return, posing a grave threat to the Holy Empire. The assistant delivered another shocking piece of news to Iriel. Not only were they facing external conflicts, but internal rebellion was also brewing, preventing them from sending more troops to the border. Iriel realized that the border situation was dire, leading the Pope to use the chosen saint as a disposable asset. Anger and rage welled up inside her as she processed the gravity of the situation. Suddenly, another servant burst into the room, breathless and panicked, reporting that the opposing forces were advancing faster than expected from the southern mountains. The threat loomed closer with each passing second, and Ariel knew they faced a formidable challenge ahead. With determination, she wasted no time and swiftly exited the room leaving the other two shocked and bewildered by the unfolding crisis. As night descended near the border, war sirens blared, signaling soldiers to awaken and prepare their weapons for the imminent enemy attack. With haste, archers were ordered to unleash a volley of arrows, signaling the commencement of battle. In the darkness, the enemy launched their assault, catching the defenders off guard. One knight, wielding divine power, bolstered the strength of her comrades, praying fervently for God to grant them bodies capable of withstanding the pain of enemy attacks. As the divine energy surged through their bodies, the knights felt a renewed sense of hope and resolve, empowering them to persevere in the face of adversity. Hope filled the hearts of the defenders as they aimed to end the battle before reinforcements arrived. Their leader cautioned them not to let their guard down, reminding them that they had only faced the weakest enemies thus far, the strongest adversaries were yet to come. However, his words were cut short as he witnessed a terrifying sight that filled him with shock and fear. Banshees perched above them, while death knights loomed ominously in the enemy ranks. Panicked, he ordered his men to retreat hastily and regroup. But before they could react, a colossal monster materialized before him, its eyes locking onto him with deadly intent. In a swift and brutal motion, the monster obliterated him, leaving chaos and panic in its wake. The knights, witnessing their leader's demise, fled in terror, scrambling for their lives. However, they soon realized that the evil forces had already surrounded them from all sides, trapping them in a desperate struggle for survival. The knights found themselves helpless against the onslaught of the monsters, being slaughtered like mere playthings with no hope of stopping the carnage. The nefarious necromancer reveled in the sight of humans being torn apart, his eyes gleaming with sadistic delight. Commanding his undead army with ruthless determination, 
he ensured that not a single human would escape alive. Infusing his minions with his evil aura, the Necromancer bolstered their strength, making them even more formidable adversaries. The knights felt the difference in power, realizing that they were facing an even greater challenge than before. In the midst of the chaos, another captain urged them to retreat, warning that fighting head-on would only lead to certain death. It was clear that their only hope lay in regrouping and waiting for reinforcements, as staying in the fray would be nothing short of suicide. As thoughts raced through his mind, wondering why reinforcements had yet to arrive and feeling abandoned by their lord, a sudden sense of dread washed over him. Before he could react, a monstrous creature materialized behind him, poised to strike. The other knights shouted a warning, but just as the creature lunged forward, another figure intervened, halting the attack and saving the knight's life. It was Rey, who had arrived just in the nick of time. Standing tall amidst the frightened knights, Rey appeared as a beacon of hope, a hero who came to their rescue when all seemed lost. 